don't eat enough protein and don't exercise will have excess body fat. A study was done in London and 40% 40, 40 of the population had excess internal body fat, even at normal body weight. So uh, the answer is a healthy, active lifestyle and an increasing protein intake, both. And uh, that helps to get rid of it. It is an inflammatory organ. When it fills up with fat, the fat goes into the liver. And fatty liver today is the third leading cause of liver transplant in the world. So the abdominal fat's a really serious issue. You get carbohydrate and you get vitamins and minerals. What's missing from the shake is the extra fat. So you, and fat has nine calories per gram compared to carbohydrate being four and protein being four calories per gram. So when you get the high fat out of the diet in that meal replacement, you have a 200 calorie meal, which you're putting instead of a 500 to 1,000 calorie meal. And so uh, the most important meal of the day is breakfast. It turns out that people eat a high protein breakfast. They're not hungry for many hours and it helps them with their weight management. So um, hot, the breakfast meal is the one we emphasize the most, but they can be used twice a day for weight management, uh, once a day for keeping uh, the weight constant over many years. And there's a number of studies, there's probably 500 studies in the literature showing this now. Uh, the first study was done in the year 2000 in Germany, and they kept people on for five years, and they found out that two shakes a day for weight loss, one shake a day for weight maintenance. So this is widely accepted now in the scientific literature is that uh, we are able to help the younger generation starting about age 14. Before age 14, you know, it's interesting when you look at the data that boys start to grow muscle, you know, age 8, 9, and 10, and we need to enforce the idea of physical activity at the school. So for young children, I certainly recommend healthy diet and exercise. I think what we start using the meal replacements would be about age 14, uh, and they're perfectly healthy, and it would, uh, at the same time teach them uh, positive uh, health habits. So everybody is very um, uh, aggressive about childhood obesity because everybody feels sorry for children being so obese, but I think it's something we have to follow through the teenage years and, and further. And it's not true that you can't reverse it. You can reverse these changes later in life. And if you have a very big child who's very obese, these are the ones that are picked out in the schools, um, it's important for that person to realize they have more muscle than other kids as well as more fat. They may be very strong, like a sumo wrestler type. And so I recommend to them uh, boxing or some kind of physical activity where they can keep their muscle strength up and feel good about their extra body strength or weightlifting or something of that sort. So I think these are the kind of things that are good for kids to do is physical activity, uh, not so much that. And for the struggling dieter, that's another group we talk about. Um, you know, so many diet books come out every year, and many of them don't work, and there's so many people with unrealistic weight loss goals, they want to weigh 40% less, and then they're always disappointed when they don't hit this dream weight. Well, when we do the body measurement, we give people a realistic goal, and then they can achieve that goal and maintain it, then they have a much better chance. But really, it's about the daily follow-up, it's about making uh, exercise a healthy addiction that you have to do every day, it's about eating food for pleasure, not just eating food out of stress. And by having these meal replacements, you plan the whole day in order to reach all your nutritional goals. And we know this works from a lot of experience around the world. You know, I think the uh, obesity problem and eating the high cost foods is much more prominent in the cities, as you say, and in middle class people in the Philippines. But for poor people, getting a nutritional adequate diet, getting vitamins and minerals is very important. What they tend to select is not always the most nutritious food. It may be high fat, it may be street foods, and often they're spending the same amount of money that they would spend for these shakes. So the way the club started was people who couldn't afford to buy a whole canister, they could afford to buy one serving. So the owner of the club would buy some, uh, some blenders, and then he makes the shakes serve each person. And then they put some fruits in it, they take pride in it. I remember some clubs, they put a little umbrella in the shake. You know, so it's a lot of idea of serving people and providing a good experience. Uh, nighttime eating is extremely common. You know, when I used to work in an emergency room, sometimes people would come in at 6 p.m. at night, and I said, when did the problem start? They said, well, 9 o'clock this morning. I said, well, why didn't you come in earlier? They said, well, it just started bothering me now. <laughs> because when the sun goes down, people get very nervous. So it turns out about 25% of obese people do night binging. So I always say, 
the best form of exercise is walk away from the refrigerator. <laughs> this is uh, really important because uh, this constant eating, you, the extra calories have been calculated to be like six, 700 extra calories from stress eating. Another problem that happens is food addiction. So it turns out there is a receptor in the brain for addiction, and uh, we can find that gene in about 20% of alcoholics. We did a study in some of our obese patients, and 50% had the same gene, and they were addicted to sugar based on some questionnaires we did. So food addic being addicted to sweet is a very common problem. And the food industry takes advantage of that. A lot of their profits are with their heavy consumers who are really addicted and you can't stop eating. So we deal with food addiction in our obesity treatment as well. But the healthiest addiction and the best stress reducer is exercise. So when you're nervous, if you exercise, it reduces stress. So we are all about healthy, active lifestyle. We have a wonderful fitness instructor, Samantha Clayton, who's made videos all over the world. And I was in China recently. We were doing 5K runs in different cities in China. So this is a global movement, and I think uh, you know, this is not a doctor office problem. This is a problem. There are not enough doctors, dietitians, or pharmacists to solve this problem. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, this is a public health issue, and we have to get the public involved in helping other people in the public with this problem because there's so many aspects to it. You need a social approach, uh, 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 a food approach, and an exercise approach, and that's what we do. So now we have all these celebrities, uh, doctors who don't know anything about nutrition, writing nutrition books and diet books. And the problem is people buy them, they go on them for a short period of time, they go off. So over a thousand diet books are written every year and they just don't work. So the problem is you need a lifetime daily process that you do all the time, not just reading a, a diet book. So I, I think that's part of the problem that we have. now. How we address it is very interesting because when we do the body composition, that personalizes it. Like if I tell you, oh, you know, it's good to lower your cholesterol in general, that's one kind of advice. But if I measure your blood cholesterol and say, hey, guy, your blood cholesterol is 250, it needs to be 200, now you have a goal to work at. So if I measure your body composition, I can tell you your lean body mass, say, is 150 pounds. And let's say you weigh... 180, you need to lose 20 pounds. But you come to me and you say, no, 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 I want to weigh 120 like I did in high school. And I say, I can't do that because you have 160 pounds or 150 pounds of lean body mass. That's your, you can't have zero fat. So now I have a discussion with you and I say, this is a good range for your body fat and you need to get your best personal shape. So don't think that you're comparing yourself to some model fashion model, and this is very much a, a woman's problem, men don't worry about this, it's a woman's problem that they link up what is, they want to be too thin, and those thin women, they're not healthy, they've lost muscle and they have increased body fat. I typically, in my office, I saw women 120 pounds with 70 pounds of lean and 50 pounds of fat, and that was not unusual. And that's when I came up with this concept, I called it sarcopenic obesity, which means low muscle, high fat. And I came up with that in 1993, just based on who I was seeing in my clinic. And how did they get there? Lack of protein intake and no exercise, and then the, the body composition changes to high fat, low protein. Now, if you really starve yourself, and you just cut all your food intake down, you're gonna get low protein again. And so you're gonna lose more muscle. That's why it's so important to eat the right amount of protein to maintain your lean body mass, exercise, and then your body will burn its own fat. So if I put a mask on your face, I can determine by measuring the gases you're putting out, how much fat you're burning and how much you know protein and carbohydrate. And with that meal replacement, you'll be burning 40% of your calories from fat. So I say it's like walking through a fast food restaurant backwards. You're basically burning as if you were eating 40, you're eating your body basically, and, and you're eating up the fat in your body and burning 40% of the calories you're burning are from your body fat.